as I started to say, I came out of the plant. There's a man standing out there. He said, won't you girls to come over to the plant at noon? We're going to organize that plant. And I said, I thought they had a union. And he looked at me and said, bewildered. I mean, he like, he said, so I just make it go over there. And I get over there before they let out for lunch. I just walked across the creek. The creek run through the town. I walked across the bridge. And I got in the plant before they, their braille rung for lunch. And went up in the plant and got with the officer of the union and told him probably going to have some trouble. He is wondering what this is going to do next. So most of the girls stayed in the plant rather than go out to lunch. So during the hour of the lunch hour, they had this huge group of men, I'd say 150 or 200 men, and one or two women. And they barricaded the door when the girls that did go out to lunch tried to get back in and wouldn't let them into work. And so then the fight ensued. We got into a fight. Those four girls, women with the men there, and tried to open the door so the ones who was outside could come in. Because in a labor controversy like that, if the company, sometimes the company plays footsie with another union, if they this has happened sometime. If you have a strong union, they think they can get a weaker union, and then you violate your contract by not getting into work and fulfill your agreement. The company can say you violate your contract and out the window you go. So we we're trying to get people in the plant. The majority of the workers were still in the plant, didn't go out to lunch. And we fought. The law did nothing about it because the bond workers union was politically strong there. So they stood there and watched it. Because the police station's right in the same building this factory was. And one or two men tried to help us, but that's all. Well, they were there then every morning to keep the people out. Well, the, a lot of the women were afraid and wouldn't go into work. They didn't want to fight. The few of us who did fight uh, didn't win, couldn't against the men. And uh, so finally the company... And, uh, well, to make a long story short, uh, then the uh, company, uh, this is something I know I can't prove, the company then found out they made a deal with them. And uh, then the uh, mayor of the town came and asked me uh, if I would uh, meet you know, to open the plant. I said, I'm ready for the plant to open any time. The company closed the plant. We didn't. Any time the plant wants to open, the company wants to open the plant, our people are ready to go to work or try to go to work. So they finally opened the plant, and, but I'd say they made an agreement with the, uh, this United Construction Work. So, Due to the fact that we had been discussing wages, the uh, labor board ruled that our contract was open, and therefore could be an election could be held, and we lost it. Very, very small majority. We lost it by a small majority because the day before the election, in the union hall to a meeting, I had. There was about 450 people working there. I had 395 people in the union meeting the day before. The people voted because they wanted to work, because of the violence. And then during this time, there had been people beat up on the street, girls' husbands, houses shot into, and uh, which made me feel very sad because I hated two unions fight. But they won the election. And the next day, they had nobody show up to work. They all came to the union, crying, sad, and everything. Nothing I could do about it. Somebody called me up and said, ask the people to come to work. I said, you forget I don't represent those people anymore. 
and I don't care what happens. That's what I, he said. I know you better than that. You do care what happens. Anyway, I told him it was more alternative. So. Who was the uh, company spokesman? Well, it was a young man who was. I always thought he was weak kneed. I, I was. His father owned the plant, and he was the plant manager. Donald Cooper. He was a young fellow, about 26 years old. He left town when I was trouble. <laughs> have the nerves stay and find out but anyway that then they uh, won but they never did get the other shot they never could get they come over and tried to put a picket line in at the other plane the small one or the big one? the small one the small one the one that and they but had but then the during that time some good friends and people who were fair got busy and went to the governor of the state and the sheriff resigned well, so some other things happened during that time. The sheriff resigned. They hired a new chief of police. And they tried to do us the same way, but at the little plant, but they didn't make it because we did have police protection. We had a new sheriff, or a man who fitted in for sheriff, who was fair. And we were going to see that law was lived up to. When you say so, they had an election, the, you mean the workers in the plant yes, elected the shooting and they national, wanted? Well, which were they, I don't say they elected the one they wanted. They elected the one they felt it was the best to keep peace. Okay, but they have this right in a plant they to choose which... Oh, it's the labor, National Labor Relations Board. Yeah, they came in. You see, otherwise they couldn't have had an election with a contract. But since we had opened the contract to discuss a wage increase, then any time you open your contract, whether that contract ends or not, we have clauses in our contract, most of them, that during the life of this contract, for the purpose of wages, we can reopen and discuss wages. Anytime you reopen your contract, another union can petition whether that contract is up or not. Most of the contracts run for three years. And you can only petition when there's one union's in the plans. Another union can only come in and try to petition for if they've got a, a, as much as a third of the people on union authorization calls to enter what we call a show of interest. They can only petition an election to be held if that contract has expired or, well, it's uh, 20 days before the expiration date of the contract or if the contract's run over three years. Uh, you made the comment that many of the women's husbands were members of United Mine Workers and yet uh, the women, in spite of that, held out. The yes, they did. Uh, would that seem to indicate that even the, uh, well, they felt the members that the, of the United Mine Workers themselves wanted the, their wives that's to right. stay in the mines? That's right. The men in the mines, the individual miners, the members of the United Mine Workers, did not condone this, told me this. The other miners, or a delegation of the miners' union from another county, or mi union members, came to me and asked me if there was any way they could help me. I did not want to get that kind of involvement. That would have been worse. And I said, no, uh, I don't want to get you people involved in an internal fight in your own union. But uh, it's quite interesting. The man who was the leader of this at the time for the United Trucking Workers is Silas Huddleston, who was accused of killing or having Jablonski killed. What? You mean that's uh, when was Silas that? Huddleston. Well, you know. The, the up in. Um, uh, he, he killed Jablonski mm -hmm. up in uh, Pennsylvania? Yes, the when one. He was running for against Tony Ball for the United Mine Workers. And was was that the one where the man's family was was killed? That's or? right. Jablonski and his wife and daughter. Silas Suttleston was the man who accused him. He's admitted it now. To get. And he was the leader of the he construction was the one that, workers. That, and was he actually ever in La Follette? Yeah, that's where he lived. He lived in Carryville. I knew him. He lived at Carryville. He was put on the staff as a organizer for the United Construction Work. Okay. The name of the mill, I forgot to ask that. Well, that was the uh, Imperial Shirt Company. Or was known up there as the Lafayette. They made Imperial Shirts. The name was the Lafayette Shirt Company. Did you ever meet Silas Huddleston? Yes, I 
you ever have any face-to-face -face concentration with uh, Mr. Hubble? Yes. He came down one day with five men. During this time, this three years, they tried to harass him. He came down one day and started in. marching up to the door, so I went to the door. Saw him in the hall, had a big window in the front. I saw him and his five men park their car and start up the steps, so I went to the door. And the secretary of the local, who, who her, her husband worked at the bus station, and he had been beaten up, she got behind the door with a 45. And he walked up to the door, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm coming in there. I said, no, you're not. He said, well, I represent those people. I said, well, if you represent them, you go rent your hall and take them over there. But the Amalgamated Clothing Workers paying the rent on this hall. And those are members of the, United, of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers in there. And you have no business in this hall. And I said, I want to tell you something, silly. I said, I believe that you're responsible for Ed Blair and Franz Daniel being beat up. I want you to know if anything happens to me, you're going to pay for it. Whether you do it or not, somebody's coming after you. And he said, well, I hope nothing don't happen to you. I said, you better because I'm holding you responsible for my welfare. So they left. But, and they tried to. Okay, they got a gang of women one day. I came out, I lived across the street from the Union Hall in what's known as the Old LaFollette Home Place. It was owned by Mr. Charlie Russell, who owned the hotel. And uh, I had lived in the house with a girl who worked in the shirt factory. We moved out of the house up into there, but we always thought we'd be safer. We were in the apartment. We felt we were safe in this little house. Where she, where she lived. So I was coming across the road and this gang of women got around me. And frankly, I was totally gun. I had a gun in my pocket because I kept one in my, in my uh, office there for my protection. And uh, I had it in my coat pocket. And uh, they got around me. Well, I knew that something happened. I didn't intend to use the gun. I only had it in the office to protect me if somebody came in. And I was only taking it to the office. I didn't carry it on my body. And uh, they ganged around me and just stood there and looked at me. So I stood there. Well, the lady whose postmistress lived in the house, right in front of the building where I lived, and she come out on the porch and asked me if I wanted to call the law. I said, Lord, no. I said, they'll help them, brother. And one of the girls who lived down the street, she come up to try to help me out. And I told her to go on back to her house. But they just stood there and looked at me because really they didn't have anything else. I said, well, if you girls uh, don't have anything to say to me, I said, yeah. I've started to the post office, which I had. But there's four carloads of men, and I figured what was going to happen. They were going to get me, try to, they were going to start to fight them, and get men was going to get me. So there's four carloads of men parked there. And they began to yell at the girls, hit her, jump on her. But you see, they really didn't, didn't, they couldn't get them to because most of those women, I did not even know, and they didn't know me. One or two of them I did know. And I had, one of the women standing there facing me when I came there as business agent was hired as a handicapped worker and was paid substandard wages and I got her off that and made the company pay her the same they paid everybody else because she wasn't handicapped. Somewhere along the line they got her a sign that she was handicapped and couldn't earn as much or work as good as the others. And I had, there stood a woman in front of me whom I had gotten off handicapped as a handicapped worker, as a, as, a, as a full worker with wages. And I didn't think that woman had anything against me. And uh, so she's, she was the only one I can remember even there that I knew. And, uh, but it was so, uh, she stood there so prominent in things I had done for her, you know. 
which was my duty to do it as a representative of the union, but it wasn't fair for her to be working in there for below the minimum wage. So anyway, I turned and turned my back on them, and I figured when I turned my back, they might have the courage to hit me, but they didn't. And I say to that that those girls did not have any animosity toward me, uh, because otherwise they would have they'd been mad, and that kind of healed people. If they had any feeling of animosity toward me, I think I would have gotten beat up there. And if they'd found a gun on me, I'd been in trouble. So I called the national office and told them what was going on. And they told me frankly, said, get out of town, just leave. They said, them people's never been nothing but trouble to us. Leave. I said, no, these people don't want to leave, leave our union. I said, they, they're loyal to the amalgamated. And I'd like to stay in here. And they said, well. We can't send you any help. So stay in there, and uh, if you stay in there, hire you a good lawyer. So I went to uh, Knoxville and hired a lawyer just in case I needed one. Was this your personal lawyer, or would he have been paid by the I don't know. I never had to use him, so I don't know. <laughs> I didn't particularly think about that. But uh, he was a, he was a uh, lawyer that I could trust. That I, that I mean, I, by reputation, I knew that he'd go with me. What I mean is, it sounds like from that that maybe the, the union was just kind of leaving you on your own, but that wasn't exactly... No, the, because a man would have been unsafe in there. I didn't feel that way at all. Okay, well, me and they, the women me and the women took care of them men pretty good. Okay. Well, they came they down said, there one day and tried to break in our union mm -hmm. hall. A bunch of the men. When they was having a meeting. They came down there with them in force one day. And we had the door locked and they couldn't get in. And they was trying to pull the door open. And uh, they couldn't get in. So the police, we had, frankly, the women in there, I had gone down with the cabinet shop in the basement of our building. I'd gone in there and sawed off me some clubs and had a pile of union on In case anybody did break in on us, we were gonna protect ourselves. And the women had their scissors from the plant that they used. And every time they'd get their hands in the crack of the door, the girls cracked their fingers. <laughs> so the law was standing out there now. Well, the law was standing, the policeman was standing there in the, in the yard of the union hall. So the girls kept doing that. And they yelled to the uh, cop and said, they've got hammers and clubs in there, in our own building. We're paying rent on And he come up and told us to open the door, and when we opened the door for him, he was a cop, he had to open the door. He stepped back and said, go to it. And then the men run in the hall and went and beat the tar out of them with them clubs. Sent seven of them to the hospital and cut their arms and scissors. They got the worst end of the deal. All uh, right, did the, um, the law happen just to get to disappear suddenly, or did he happen yeah, to get into the I don't know what happened. To so tell you the truth, when he stood, opened the door and said, go to it, and those guys come rushing in the hall. I don't know what happened to him. I just wondered if he got a look or two. Was that the sheriff or the police? No, he was the city policeman. You said that you were renting the Union Hall. Who owned it? Francis Cole Company. Okay. Well, did anyone uh, suffer any reprisals from these people for actually for renting you the hall? No, you, uh, no. It was Francis Cole Company owned the building, and uh, we were renting it on a uh, month-to-month -month basis we didn't have a lease and I was I had tried to sign a lease I was afraid we'd get put out of the good building would seat over a thousand people which we had close to a thousand of us and I was we had put the carpet on the floor and fixed the building up and I had tried to get a lease to protect ourselves because if we had given up our carpeting and our we had a real nice place the girl we had raised the money through parties and things to make us a nice hall. We had a good lounge, we had a kitchen and everything, and I hated to. I felt like maybe someday if we fixed the place up and spent the money, but we weren't paying for $25 a month for him. And I was so afraid that he might rent it out from under us, but I tried to get a lease and he wouldn't do it. Okay, maybe. So it finally happened, somebody did lease it out from under us during this time. 
but did the coal company really, uh, that was, we're talking about a coal mining company. That's right. right. Did, they really didn't mind seeing a union hold out against the United Mine Workers or, I or against an, an organization? If they did, did, I didn't know anything about it. I, I, Actually, this Francis Coal Company was operating under a union agreement with the United Mine Workers and was not covered by workman's compensation. Okay, well, that's what I mean. They and I say them. this. I, I say this. If and I res respect the men in the mines, but John L. Lewis's union was strong. Why did he let his men work in the mine where they weren't covered for workman's compensation? Well, I just thought, well, the in coal fact, they had a, In fact, there was an explosion up there and 10 men killed. And the amalgamated clothing workers wasn't much, but the amalgamated clothing workers sent $1,000 down after me to help those families because they didn't have no workman's compensation. And the United Mine Workers didn't give them a thin dime. Now, the two shops now. Who has them? Well, one of the shops, the the uh, the small shop, after World War II, after the war's over, smaller shops begin to be gobbled up by the larger shops, and individual trade names of shirts begin to be. Uh, the competition got so so okay. so uh, bad for shirt business that name brand shirts took over. And George Saltzman was so proud who he owned that plant. It was a privately owned plant. Very, as, a, as an employer, he was a very good employer. He was hard to deal with once you made a demon. He, had, he was really very sympathetic. But uh, he would not take contract work. We tried to get him to go into contract business, and he wouldn't do it. So he uh, closed the plant in 19. I think it was about 1950. He finally had to close because he could not compete with a brand name shirt. He made a little shirt called Stetson and had done good business. And he'd gotten old in the meantime and he had other interests. The two shops, the big one and the little one, were now owned the, by the same name? No. Uh -uh. Okay. The large plants now have been gobbled up by the Imperial Reading, which is the Pennsylvania Reading Coal Company. I mean, on me editing railroad. I remember in listening to the tape where you gave the uh, lecture at Georgia State you know, to one of the classes that you were talking about the big conglomerates and um, the, um, the unions and dealing with these conglomerates. And you feel that, that dealing with the uh, large conglomerate is much different than dealing with someone like this man who is That's an individual right. owner. Most of our concerns were individually owned. I don't think there's but one, I I'm, I'm, think I'm correct in saying there's only one clothing concern that's still family owned. And uh, most of them have been bought out by interest other than clothing, or other than the, than the garment industry. And uh, we deal now with people who, to my, in, in my opinion, they're not interested really. I, I, in quality, I think that's why a lot of, uh, I think uh, conglomerates, uh, I think it'll be proven they're inefficient because everybody's hired. Nobody has a real feeling for the, for, for, for the industry, particularly in clothing and cotton garment I'm talking about. They're working for, from the president on down, the man's hired. And you know, he, he just gets through the day without getting blamed for something himself <laughs> and blame shifted from this one to that one. And when, when management don't care, workers will get to where they don't care. And when there's not somebody there who has a stake in that business, real stake in it, I think it's the business suffers. In the garment business, you is there a production system like, um, I'd say the workers earn a, so much per hour for each hour they put in the plant, right? That's right. We're piecework industry. Most of the workers work on piecework. And they paid so much for each piece that they... Yeah, the rate is set. And then, but first, the union agrees on what we feel the average worker working at an average speed should earn per hour. Then we tell the company now, if you set the rates to yield that money, we'll not argue. 
for the people on a, say, ten girls working on the job, the average girl can't earn, say, two and a half. We agree two and a half should be the average wage. That means the slower ones will make less, the little, the fast ones will make more. But if that job don't yield that, then we're going to come in and talk to you about, are you paying enough? Who's, uh, do you have some sort of, um, time management people that yeah. come in and time these jobs the, and so When forth? we get into controversy over a piece rate, at the company is now all, before World War II, uh, an engineer was practically unheard of and gone with that. Because most of the men came from the industry and they knew the shirt. Well, with the change of style, changes of material, and the changes in the industry that's gone on since World War II, I see that they're needed. Once was a time a shirt was a shirt. You set a sleeve in, and the only thing could in, could concern the sleeve, you set a rate for sleeving, another rate for sleeving. The only, only differences you might have on rates was due to fabric, or stripes, or checks, or plaid. But with changes of the men's clothing, and I think it's good, it's helped to it stimulate the industry. With style change, individual initiative. There's no incentive. If everybody's going to make the same thing, what's the incentive for a worker to do a little bit above the average? But I can see that in your industry... Well, that's that not true in union shops, but it certainly is true in non-union. Because if you get a fast operator who, due to her skill, she's able to earn better than the other girl, the rate will be cut. So the fastest person sets the pace where there's no control. The union kindly can, that's where your working conditions, especially the peace workers. That's why I think peace workers need a union. Uh -huh. Well, all people need, but especially, because if you get a, the rate set on the speed of the operator, not what the job is worth. And the union tries to set a rate on what a job is worth. Then the girls, according to their own ability or skill, or how hard they want to work and earn what they want to, without the fear of having that rate cut. Day, That's right? right. But you pay for what the job is, is, is worth pretty well. Uh, individual increases in rates for length of service with the company, is that no, permissible? No. That, uh, so someone who's been there a long time can make the same thing as someone well, who's we brand have new? No, no, it takes uh, on, on time work job. Uh, we have uh, periods of service to get up to the rate for the job. Uh, it's less for, it's based on the skill of the job and how long it takes to learn. The only time work job, or piece work job. Of course, the girl comes in there and works at the piece rate. Right? Regardless of and how long she's And the faster she learns the job and gets up to production, well, then she, she can earn the money if she can get there, but usually it takes. There's hardly any jobs in a shirt factory. We have some jobs girl can be up to uh, making the minimum wage in six weeks, four to six weeks. Some would take six months or a year. But she won't be earning the top money. She will be out of what we call out of the red. The company won't, they'll be, she'll be earning the minimum. And uh, then she, as time goes on, she'll learn the next and next, cut the corners here and there, and she can earn money. Uh, our average wage runs around $3 an hour stitches and shirts. It runs around three fifty an hour in clothing. <coughs> it's uh, more skilled, heavier material. <coughs> and better organized. <coughs> Most of your mills located in, in small towns or rural areas? 
as opposed oh, to these yes. large urban areas? <coughs> oh yes, uh, they can get workers better in a small town called job. Now, of course, a lot of, and I think it's so good. We tried. Uh, I used to talk when I was a business agent. I was a business agent 15 years in Tennessee. What does a business agent do to actually Well, after the shop's organized, then we have a business agent who assists the officers and stewards in, in running their union. And they, if the grievance can't be settled in the shop, by the shop committee or the chairman or chair lady of the plan, then the business agent comes in and takes up. dominate the woman, but the man that isn't looked up to in the home, it, it doesn't the children, I just really think that. I think that the man and the woman should play an equal part. But you know, if a man hasn't got a job and the woman's going out of the man's up on the courthouse tower whittling, kids is going to be, it's going to make kids feel, huh? I suppose I'm supposed to be the most, so many black women get about that, that, that this is, that uh, it calls they never knew that a father gets up to the door something like that. I'm sorry to say this. I think it's a good time. But uh, they, never, they sleep in the town. They never thought about that. And that would go on out to these little towns. You know? and they never, it never dawned on them to try to get in the first place something to hire me, something to pay the best. But the skill wasn't there, like the world was. There was no skill for any heavy industry. The least, the best industry was this who required a little skill, a garment. But this was prior to World War II. Yeah. After World War II, some of these young men went away to service. They learned trade. So they went into the other place. And through education, they played a part. And equipped to be better to learn to do it. I've heard the remark made um, that for my home county, Pickens County, that the best thing that ever happened to it was the opening of the Lockheed plant. I don't believe it was called that at the time, no, the Obama plant, because people who had never done any kind of factory work in their lives went there and worked and after the war they came back and they had a labor source of people that they had never had before. If anything good I think can go to war. If anything is good, it does. Let people learn understand how other people live and go away and see other people. I think it's done a lot to bridge the gap, not only black and white but the other nation. You know, the people who live different from the different cultures. Well, you worked um, in organizing in Tennessee and Kentucky and Alabama. <coughs> and I know that 
know that in certain Georgia, states, North, South Carolina, and Florida. <laughs> I was singling out Tennessee, Kentucky, and yeah. North Georgia as being an area that doesn't have any blinds, you know, as compared to... North Georgia, but North Georgia, you know. You know, in North Georgia, we never had any blacks, but they were slaves on a farm. The hill people didn't have to get to their own farm. So. Right, absolutely. Uh, for example, the neighboring county to mine doesn't have a single black family in it today. Um, what I was getting at, though, was uh, did you have any experience? But you know, the first black policeman I ever saw was about well in Alabama did you know it? no we didn't even uh, as I remember we never had no problems like that in the mines and steel where there were a lot of black work now we had trouble but everybody accorded that, them the same rights as no that's what I'm fixing to say well, there were certain jobs in the steel not in the mines because we done gold it wasn't that much there's certain jobs in steel that you could black that's where we had problems with the United Steelworkers being caught in that heat. You know, you know people like to keep the United Steelworkers in there, but it's, 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 they didn't they had, they had inherit in the sea. And it's taken a long time for that. The Union certainly doesn't. But I know our Union. But, but the Union, until recently, like in the steel mills, didn't really involve themselves in trying to provide equality. Well, the men and the members were so jealous of that. Sometimes the leaders wanted to do what you got to do. You've got to have it. All right, you take us. I was going to take the whole state of the whole course. This. Before, the, before it got worse, that's what I was going to say. Back in the 50s, when the blacks first started agitating, and Alabama being the starting place for it, uh, I could just see blacks in unions suddenly saying, okay, I've never had that job, and I'm blacks have never had it and we want it and starting trouble within the union did this happen well uh, I I don't know I guess it did but you see because of the fact that seniority is a contract we have out young people today I think they don't believe it I think they're misunderstanding and I think I believe this I think some special consideration should be given to black people should be given the safety, give a little help up over us. And I don't know just exactly how they do it, but I do think they do some consideration. But you, we have our seniority, and I wouldn't want to do away with seniority, but because of the fact that the black people are still coming to me, I think most unions are based on curiosity. And our industry quality qualification has to be equal the seniority in order to get on the job. If conditions are equal then most senior person gets the job. Bid on it. Gets the job. They can bid. The most senior person get it if conditions are equal. Say two people are bidding on the job. If one has done that job some part time or something, then they're more qualified. Right. We have to have that. We have to we would price our, our, our union companies out of business. Yeah. If we run by strict seniority. You have to be sensible when you Do you think that your work in the labor movement and in the small towns and the areas where poverty is so widespread, really, and so forth, gives you a different view of, of the black situation and what they're asking for? Do no, I've, I've, I worked with the blacks. Well, I first experienced That's what I mean, that you We had blacks things. working, but they paid them less than they did us. Now, it, 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 I reckon the first thing I thought about, because my father was a union man, I believe in you, nobody can tell me what a union was. I went to my first union meeting when I was seven years old with my mother. But I saw this, and I used this a lot with people when I was trying to organize the place I worked at the Bonner. Couldn't work with Slag. They worked with the black person. We went home because they worked too. Now, this went on in the place I worked. A few black people there. Well, it wasn't right on the basis they were doing the work, but if you want to look at it from a selfish standpoint. It was hurting me they worked cheaper. It's like a woman going in and working cheaper than a man does the same thing. 
I think a lot of times that's why men resisted women because they thought they were. And it's like, well, what? It's, they, to get the job, they probably spoiled anything. Not knowing no better. But women, I think, hurt themselves sometimes like that. Because they, because they think they can live cheaper or live in a second job or uh, lived at home, you know? But they didn't need the, need the money. I know women that uh, would accept the job. Maybe displace a man for less money. I'm going to ask a question now that I know is a controversial question. Do unions contribute to inflation? I don't think so. Because uh, any labor union, in my experience, irregardless of what anybody says, a sensible labor leader has to see that the company makes money and gets along. And they're consumers themselves. And if they're going to have every wage increase, they get gobbled up with high prices. They're defeating their own purpose. And it just doesn't make sense. I think, you know my feeling about what I think about this, there is this pressing, pressing inflation rate. It's because too few and big conglomerates control what's being produced. And the money is available now through government spending and uh, high employment, and they're charging. We pay it or we don't, yeah, we don't produce it. And I think the oil business, I feel like that was a strike against them, which they had a right to do, to hold out for a high price of oil. I feel more or less that that was a strike to get the price uh, where they wanted it. And I think the main thing now today that we have to face is for this inflation is two companies by joining together in this conglomerate are controlling the production and they can get any price they ask because you have to have certain things. And, the, and because people at a high rate there when a worker, I saw this during the Depression of the 30s. I, like I said, I come from a home where my father uh, and my mother kept up with things. And I heard it, and I believe it is true today. If one man loses a job, he's going to buy that. He's going to throw somebody else out of the job. If he buys less. Hoover, who was president of the United States, and saw this coming. Warn the businessmen, don't lay off, try to keep on. So the greed that is human, mostly in human nature, they just just didn't follow his advice. Now, I think the Herbert Hoover knew what to do, he just didn't do it. Okay, let me ask you Couldn't this. do it, let's say, maybe couldn't. This, let, let me ask you this. Let's take a town like La Folla, and, and the union has organized and, and people in that who work for the, um, the companies that are unionized in that town are making certain wages. Do you feel that the rest of the laboring force in that area therefore benefits from the union also? I certainly do because uh, that's why sometimes in small towns we get opposition from store owners and other people employ people. They feel that the shirt factory make more money, they'll have to pay their workers more than a fifty good shirt back. I saw this happen in a small town and I had three school teachers put to teach the school and work shirt back because they earned more money. That was a shame. But it happened. One of them's a retiree today. So there's no retirement Mary, and she got to work there. And she was a teacher. She could earn more money. Maybe interrupt just right. I guess you'll want to speak to